Hello and welcome to the Blobbering Comedy Podcast for July 8th, 2024. This is episode 222. My gosh. 222 episodes. 222 of the Blobbering Comedy Podcast. Stand-up comedian, improviser, actor, and dreamer. Paul Green documenting my journey as a performer in this crazy world. And um, I'll tell you, I am I am just in the thick of some really exciting things, sort of at the bottom of the mountain looking up. Um, if this is your first time joining me, I am a stand-up comedian in the Phoenix area as well as an actor. And about three, four months ago, a fellow comedian friend of mine reached out and said, hey, we should do a podcast together. And I thought, wait a minute, I already have a podcast that nobody listens to. Why would I need a second one? And my apologies to all of you who just heard that and go, wait a minute, well, I'm listening to the podcast. Thank you very much for that. So anyway, we started a podcast. That podcast very quickly uh, became a live show, and we did a live taping of our podcast in front of an audience, and the show was absolutely phenomenal. And he and I have just sort of hitched our wagons to each other and have decided, hey, this is how we want to try to make our mark in the world, is uh, doing this show and... Um, it's only been a couple of months. We've already had some really great experiences, some highs and some lows, as is always the case with life and trying anything. So it was pretty much our first three shows. We did pretty well in terms of ticket sales and getting an audience. Our fourth show is this Thursday, and it, it has dropped precipitously since our last show. It's just... Like, there is nobody in Gilbert, Arizona, who is in town and wants to see our show. And by nobody, I don't mean nobody. We we're, we have, like, 20 tickets between solds and comp tickets. Uh, for contrast, our last show in Gilbert, we had a 100. Literally every seat was full, and now we're at 20% of that. Um. Now, is there a chance we'll get a few more? Yes, but the trend um, is not looking good. So we'll see how that goes. I think the show itself will be fine. It, it, you know, smaller audiences, that happens all the time. As a comedian, you perform in front of audiences of all sizes. Over the weekend, I performed in front of an audience of about 400 and then an audience of about 100 and now it'll be 20, or maybe, my guess is maybe we'll get up to about, I'm hoping about 35, 40 by the time Thursday rolls around. And then um, right after that, um, our next shows that we have on the books are very big shows, and those are scheduled for August 9th and August 10th. And uh, ticket sales for both of those are also absolutely abysmal. Um, one of the shows is in Vail, Arizona, and we have where it's at a theater, and we have a six hundred seat capacity. We have sold two, um, which is less than the capacity. Uh, the other venue holds about two hundred, and we've sold four. So there is some room for improvement. And, uh, you know, it's just really been an interesting um, change of priority and a change of focus over these last couple of months. Um, I think for so many comedians, and myself included, we get into comedy, and the assumption is, oh, I'm going to do comedy, and then I'm going to get funny, and then people are going to pay me millions of dollars to be funny. And that is the hope, and that is the dream. However, uh, statistically, that is not what happens <laughs> for the vast, vast, vast majority of comedians. Um, 
if you get really, really good and really funny, sure, you always have a chance. Now, if you're famous, if you have a certain look, you know, if if you have the full package, then fame can definitely happen. And I have a buddy who is uh, on Saturday Night Live right now who started comedy at the same time because he had the full package. He was young. He was funny. He was creative. He was charming. Uh, he was unique. He was a brilliant writer. And he worked his ass off and he hustled and boom, seven, eight years in his career, however long it was, he was on Saturday Night Live. Like that does happen. Um, aside from that, there is a large contingent of stand-up comedians who are just trying to get stage time. And if you even get paid for it, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm actually getting paid. Um the next level beyond that is you get to a certain level to where, you know, you, you have a strong resume, you've built up um, a strong contact list of bookers and producers who know that they can hire you, put you on the show, you're going to show up, you're going to be professional, you're going to crush it with their crowds, and then they'll pay you whatever it is worth to them to pay you, um, which is usually not a whole heck of a lot. Um, just depending on the venue, some or the booker, some are great. Some can really do a good job and be very fair. Others, maybe not so much, but that is the nature of the beast. So the other option, and this is the option that I'm now exploring, is you produce your own shows and you go, all right, I'm going to create a show and I'm going to try to figure out how to sell my own tickets and then keep all of the money. And... Ultimately, that's what me and my buddy Josh are trying to figure out, which is we have this show concept. We love the show concept. Our audiences have loved the show concept. The first show we did, it was just so clear to us that this was something very special. It was so funny. It was so much fun. It was high energy. It was spontaneous. It's music. It's improv. It's comedy. I mean, it's just this incredible synergy of... Uh, performance uh, performance elements, um, all of which are my specialty and Josh's specialty. And then the two of uh, us combining our forces has just been really great. But we've now entered into this different uh, lane here to where instead of bookers just saying, hey, come to my show and I'll pay you 200 bucks or I'll pay you 300 bucks or I'll pay you 500 bucks or whatever it is, we are now in a different game and the game now is we book a venue (laughs) and uh, we work out whatever our split is with the venue or whatever the rental fee is with the venue and then um, we go try to sell tickets to it and we have a marketing team we have somebody working on more of our organic social media and then we have a um, another person who is doing paid social media ads and we're really have we've really become reliant on our advertising to drive sales. And when the sales don't come in, it's like we just lose a ton of money because we're spending a lot of money on ads, on personnel, and you know to get ads and videos all cut and and uh, out there. And then we just have no idea. We have no idea uh, how many sales are ultimately going to be a result of any one advertising campaign. And and already just three shows in or four shows come this Thursday, we've already had pretty mixed results. And overall, we have not made money. So it is, it has been a very interesting journey and i'm also very much aware i mean it's like we're starting a new business right and no new business almost no new business is profitable right away i mean there is this period of friction and frustration and you're usually losing money and sometimes losing money for a long time especially if you're getting into the corporate world i mean that's just in small business when you get into Silicon Valley, you get into venture capitalism, you get into, uh, you know, technology development, software development. I mean, there there's companies who will lose money for five, 10 years. I mean, they're losing millions every year um, in hopes 
that eventually what it, whatever it is that they're trying to develop will develop and become a successful, viable product. And then next thing, uh, you know, everybody knows is this product is now an American staple or a worldwide staple or whatever it is. And next thing you know, all those venture capitalists look like geniuses and they're making money hand over fist. But um, there is usually a tremendous amount of upfront loss <laughs> of going into uh, the red um, before um, you start to see things profitable. Um, so I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not discouraged. It's, it's, a, it's, it's new, right? So it's growing pains and there's a little bit of frustration of going, well, well, how were we able to sell a lot of tickets on the very first show before anybody knew? We didn't even know what the heck we were doing. And in the second show, we sold a heck of a lot more and it was better. And then we had a third show at a different venue, which was great. And now we're back at sort of our OG venue with a, what should be a lot more momentum. And then it's like screeching halt, falling off a cliff. So... It's it's just kind of a fun ride. And I'm just trying to look at it like that of just going, well, this is part of the journey. This is part of having a dream. This is part of trying to expand into a new space. This is um, part of trying to be a money producer as opposed to a expense. Um, you know, being an owner instead of an employee. That's what's so fascinating to me is there's this sort of... Um, uh, reverence or this, well, in some cases, disdain for business owners. Oh, you're a business owner. Oh, you you must be so rich. It's like uh, business owners get paid last. You want to know who gets paid first? Every other freaking employee in the company. Employees get their money first, even if they're useless, even if they didn't show up for a month because they took advantage of a bunch of sick leave or <laughs> you know what I mean? They're still getting their money. And yet the owner, who has probably also invested and sacrificed tons of money, uh, has to pay them first and pay everybody else first and have, you know, pay for the office space and pay for the software programs and pay for the insurance and, and you know, pay for the materials and the supplies and the computers and the blah, 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 blah. And then... If he's lucky, if there's anything, or she is lucky, after all of that, if there's anything left over, then maybe the owner gets to take a cent or two. But usually on new businesses, owners are taking all of their money and turning it right back around and throwing it back into the business. And that is what's going down. I'm, I've am i entered into comedic entrepreneurship. And it's it's just a different game, but it's very exciting because the the other side of this is there is no ceiling. As an employee, there's usually a ceiling. No matter how good of an employee you are at any sort of given position, there is usually a cap. Somebody working this job will never really make more than X amount of dollars, right? It's like if you're an elementary school teacher, it doesn't matter how good of an elementary school teacher you are for how long. Your salary is going to cap at X amount of dollars after so many years, and there ain't no going up beyond that. And as a stand-up comedian, there's some similarities to that if you are looking to get booked. You know, you, you can only work so many clubs and work out so many, uh, you know, corporate gigs or college gigs or whatever it is that you're doing, but they're going to pay what they're going to pay. And what I'm entering into is a higher risk scenario, but there is almost no limit to the upside, right? It's, well, if we can sell a thousand tickets in a town at 20 bucks, then we've made, what is that, 20,000 bucks? And uh, that's what we can do in that town. And then if we can go to the next town and sell 5,000 tickets, you know, a, a thousand seat venue and we can sell five shows in a weekend, that, well, then that's 5,000 uh, tickets at 20 bucks. Okay, so now we have 100,000. And um, 
you know, if in the next town we can sell five 1,000-seat venues, is my math tracking here? I've kind of lost track. You get the point, though. And then maybe it gets to a point to where it's like, oh, yeah, well, we can sell 5,000 tickets in this town, but guess what? We can now sell them for 50 bucks. So now it's 5,000 times 50, which is 250,000? I don't think my math is right on that. Uh, 5,000 times 50, that's 25 plus four zeros. Yeah, that's 250,000. So it's like, oh yeah, we can sell 5,000 tickets um, we can sell out a thousand seat venue five times at forty dollars a ticket. Now we're two hundred and fifty thousand. Um, you know what I mean? And it and it and it just goes up from there because it's we can always theoretically we can always increase the number of tickets we can sell, and we can always increase the ticket sales price indefinitely. It's just a matter of what will the market bear? What's the interest and um, and that's what's exciting is entering into an arena with no ceiling. Um, and that's what I'm excited about. And both Josh and I are, we're all in and we've said that plenty of times. And every time we hang out and talk about it, we're, we're just really excited. And yes, we're also realistic. We know it's going to take time. It's going to take work. It's going to take hustle. It's going to take grind. It's going to take losing money. Sometimes it's going to take some shows not selling any tickets and dealing with that and just taking the loss and then learning what we can and moving on. But overall, it is a very exciting venture. So with that, I am excited. Now, those of you listening to the podcast know that I started listening to the audiobook of The 48 Laws of Power, and I am not enjoying it at all. And yet I'm still reading it. I don't know why. So what I've been doing is just going chapter by chapter, talking about or, or just saying what the chapter talks about, like the law of power, and then just talking about usually why I don't like it <laughs> or why I don't like that that's a law of power. Although I can't really disagree with the book. I I just feel that the book is discussing power in a context of cynicism and primal, like a very primal, um, greedy, war-like context. And I'm fully aware that there is plenty of elements of the human experience that are actually very consistent with that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that I'm naive to the fact that, yes, there are very much circumstances and people and organizations and governments and what have you that are that in order for somebody to be successful in those environments will require to some degree an exercise of these laws that the book is uh, is espousing um I think there's a part of me, though, that goes, well, first of all, I, I, uh, I, I, man, I hope I'm not naive. I don't feel like that is the game that I'm playing to exert power in these very primal, cold, cynical um, demonstrations. Did I say that right? Kind of lost track of my sentence. So... Anyway, what I've been doing is just talking about each law of power, and then what I want to start doing is discussing um, perhaps what I wish the law was. Is that naive? Is it hopeful? Is it a little bit having some faith in humanity that not every human being is a calculated calloused, cynical, uncaring, um, almost psychopathic 
person who is willing and happy to exert power in any form to obtain goals, but not not only to obtain their goals, but in, in essence to defeat others. I mean, the, the book is very war driven because it's not only hey this is this is how you exert power to get what you want but this is also how you lose that power to crush your enemies and it very much sets up a you versus the world you versus your enemy and again i'm not suggesting that there are not legitimate enemies out there and that there are not people who would happily um do the same in reverse right um who would happily exert these laws of power and manipulation against you or against myself to achieve some sort of gain. And I have experienced um, some incredibly um, shrewd and cynical and... uh, downright villainous in my point of view behavior that was has was and has been destructive to me what i have tried to do in response to that is to not respond like for like but to analyze what was done to me and then as best as i can ensure that i do not ever behave towards someone else in the same manner that I was treated. Instead of treating others like I've been treating, treated when that treatment was um, destructive, harmful, deceptive, destructive, um, that I go That's not who I want to be. And I don't want revenge. I look at it as... I mean, I'm not that altruistic. I I want revenge, but the revenge that I want is to be so above that behavior that my life is full of joy and full of genuine connections and people and relationships and opportunities and success success that is achieved without me having to exert unrighteous power against other people or or betray and defeat and cut other people down so that I look bigger or destroy my enemies so that all has been conquered by me and I am now supreme ruler of... I mean, I I don't know. And who knows? You know, I don't know what the future has to hold. You know, if World War Three kicks in and all of a sudden, you know, there's uh, armies and tanks, you know, rummaging through uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Well, you know... Maybe I'll need to uh, (laughs) uh, adjust my viewpoint, although I hope not, because I don't really think it's ever a matter of circumstance. I think what defines character is a consistent behavior despite of circumstance. And um, that's what I'm striving for. I'm not great at it. You know, I have my vain ambitions and my selfishness and and my my desires to satisfy an ego and to accomplish and to be successful. But at the same time, I have zero interest in doing that at the unwilling participation of anybody else or at the expense, or or at the destruction of somebody else. Matter of fact, I would prefer it be the opposite. I would prefer that as I achieve, that I'm able to do so with like-minded individuals who are also able to 
enjoy fulfillment and enjoy success and and to me i think the only enemy is the enemy that is within myself my own demons and my own insecurities and my own um my own inner voices and you know the, the 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 voices that give me all of the i'm not enoughs and the you don't deserve that's and if you don't do x y and z that means you're bad and blah 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 i mean that's that's really the only enemy i'm fighting and as long as i've conquered that then you know i would say uh whatever anybody else who is trying to exert power against me whatever they're dealing with has nothing to do with me. At least that's what I would hope that I can obtain is that mindset more and more so. So anyway, today's law of power said, I don't think I can't remember exactly word for word, something like, um, reputation is everything or or your reputation your the most important thing is your reputation guarded at all costs and what's so fascinating to me is i actually listened to the uh, uh, a few minutes of that chapter again just to refresh my mind because i'm i'm actually way ahead in the book i'm going chapter by chapter but i'm already in like chapter 18 but this is i think chapter five or six and the first thing the book talks about is, yeah, you need to guard your reputation because that's where you get your greatest power. And also, the best way to defeat your enemies is to poke a hole in their reputation. I'm just going like, (laughs) can this book go like one minute without just turning everything into how you can just screw people over for for your gain and smite your enemy by destroying their reputation? I'm going like, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. You absolutely could do that. You know, you can do the smear campaign. I mean, gosh, let's look at the political climate. It's just, it's disgusting. It's disgusting. So to me, I do think reputation is important. What I think is more important is, and perhaps which will lead, with a principle that will lead to a more fulfilling um, exertion of power is... trying to learn who people really are despite what an alleged reputation says or doesn't say because uh, we live in a world of social media and smear campaigns and uh, salacious headlines and um, you know media is pretty good at painting people in certain light or painting certain political parties in one light and uh we are the one and true party and the other people are this and those who vote for this person are that and people who feel this way are this evil and people who follow this cause are blah 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 and people who follow my cause are of course all saintly godly people and anybody else who doesn't are evil and blah 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 and um I would say um, engaging in that sort of behavior probably will get you some wins and probably also uh, create a lot of enemies for you. I think the higher law of power is learning to meet people where they are and giving people a a chance to show um, who they really are and, and how they will or won't show up or um, maybe hearing another side of the story and um, allowing human beings to have some nuance and some uh, subtlety to them because human beings are beautiful uh, creatures also very complex also capable of great evil and deceit and misbehavior but also uh, capable of really great and incredible things and I think it's a great disservice to um, write somebody off based off of a reputation. And that is not to say that there are people who um, 
are probably not in alignment with whoever we are and what it is that we're striving for. And that doesn't mean that every human being deserves your time or your emotions or your uh, resources. But maybe it's just an opportunity to uh, give people a chance if you can, as long as you're safe and at the end of the day if uh you get betrayed or people turn their back on you or they turn around and try to destroy your reputation again that's an opportunity to demonstrate character to me character is the greatest power that any one person truly has which is i i treat people a certain way even if they have not behaved in a manner that necessarily uh, or behaved in a manner that would warrant perhaps uh, a different uh, response or different reaction. So that's that's my thoughts on that. Yes, reputation is incredibly important. And yes, you could destroy people by trying to poke holes in their reputation. I've had people do it to me. I have an ex who... Uh, posted an incredibly nasty Facebook message about me trying to assassinate my character and try to convince everybody what a horrible person is. And you want to know what? I could have turned right around and done the same thing in return. But that's not who I am. She posted that. That's who she is. Um, so, you know, could I have exerted power in the way the book said and try to counter that uh, reputation uh, assault. Absolutely, I could have. But I looked at it as the people who really know me and really love me are going to see right through that. Anybody who reads that and is going to make an opinion of it without getting to know me based off of that are not people that I'm interested in having in my life anyway, and I feel bad for them because they missed out because I uh, am pretty good to people who are good to me and treat me with love and respect and compassion and forgiveness all right everybody that got very soapboxy my apologies i promise i am a comedian although i did not do one funny thing on this podcast (laughs) that's really not the intention of this i i'm you know this isn't a podcast by a comedian for for and about comedy. Comedy just happens to be my pursuit and my dreams, but I am really about um, life and going for what you want in life and trying to find fulfillment and happiness and meaning in a manner that uh, uh, speaks to you and resonates. And, And I fully acknowledge and recognize that that is actually not that easy to accomplish, which is why... I've dedicated a significant portion of my life to trying to study that and understand that element of humanness. And that's what I like talking about on the Paul Green Comedy Podcast. So, all right, everybody, let's go um, destroy all of our enemies' reputations and exert power and... Uh, <laughs> and Let's see, you know, if that makes your life more fulfilling. My suspicion is that will just lead you to a path of uh, creating your own hell. But there you go, everybody. All right. That is it for today. I went a little long today. I usually keep these around 20 minutes. But, man, I got on a soapbox there. Did I not? So I love you all so much. I hope you're doing well. I hope your life is full and meaningful and that you are... Uh, pursuing your dreams and doing so in a manner that is fulfilling and bringing joy to you and others. So that is all for today. This is for July 8th, 2024, episode 222 of the Paul Green Comedy Podcast. I love you all so much. I'll talk to you tomorrow.